What's going on, Chicago? It's your boy, Ron J, signing in, Coca Cola signing for the Pride, and the host of We Real Chicago. Welcome to episode 12. Thank you all for tuning in and rocking with us. We really do appreciate you guys. We got a great show lined up on tonight for the congregation now. <laughs> so stay tuned, and hey, guys, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the Pride YouTube channel. We're going to go ahead and jump right in. It's shopping and gift giving season family. This week, the city, along with the Chicago Urban League, rolled out an initiative called Black and Black Friday to encourage us all to spend green and shop black on Friday. Here with me today to tell us more about Black Shop Friday is Chicago Urban League President and CEO, Karen Freeman Wilson. Welcome to We Real uh, Chicago, Miss Lady President. Well, sir, glad to be with you today. How are you, Ron I'm Jay? Doing great. Thank you for asking. How are Good. you? I'm doing well, thank you. That's wonderful. So, Madam President, if you could just tell us a little bit more about just who you are and what you do, please, the floor is yours. So I'm the uh, president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. My name is Karen Freeman Wilson. I've been here since January. Uh, prior to that, prior I was the the mayor of Gary, but right now we're talking about Black Shop Friday. And, and that is essentially the effort to put the black in Black Friday. We all know about shopping on the day after Thanksgiving. We also know that um, very often people go to the larger stores, the Walmarts and Best Buys of the world. And we're simply saying that as we increase our online shopping, as we think about what role we can play in um, reducing the racial wealth gap, shop in a Black business, patronize a Black business. And we believe that if people do that, they will be pleased and they will continue to shop over and over again. So, and for those that don't know, Madam President, if you don't mind us backing it up, what's the, what is the Chicago Urban League? The Chicago Urban League is that organization that has been for over 100 years, been fighting for racial equity and economic equity in the black community in Chicago. We're one of 90 affiliates uh, and we promote that equity through programming and housing and economic development and small businesses, youth services, and in leadership development and workforce development in the black community. All right, and we're here talking about Black Shop Friday. So why don't we go yes, ahead sir. and jump to some questions. Um, so as you know, Black Friday is of course one of the biggest shopping days of the year. What inspired the Urban League and the city to launch this initiative? Well, it was something that was actually born out of one of the larger advertising firms, OKRP, uh, O'Keefe, Reinhardt and Paul, and a brother there by the name of Aubrey said, you know, I wanna do something. I wanna do something to support my people. And this is what I think ought to happen. And that's when he came up with the idea of Black Shop Friday and brought it to the city. They brought it to us and we said, absolutely, we wanna be a part of this. Now, we've seen this trend of supporting black people and businesses in light of the uprisings this summer across the nation. Um, would you say, Madam President, that that uh, that that in COVID-19 has been a factor in creating this? Oh, there's no question about it. We know that there have been many black businesses that have been forced to close because of the quarantining associated with COVID-19. We know that, uh, you know, for a long time, we couldn't go to the barber shop or the beauty shop. Uh, and as a result of that, it created a strain. At the same time, uh, the racial unrest that we saw, the civil unrest, I should say, impacted black businesses. They sustained damage. And while we have been supporting them through grant programs that have been provided through the city, the state, the county, 
we also know that the best way to support a black business is to ensure that they have a diverse customer base. This is what that campaign is all about. And just to be clear, we're not just talking about doing it during the holiday. We're talking about doing it 365 days a year. It's kind of like black history. Hey Amen. I heard that. Don't just give us a month or a day. Give us there the you whole go. year. That's what you you're talking about. about. And if you're just now tuning in, guys, it's your boy, Rome J. I'm here with the CEO and uh, lady president, uh, Miss Karen Freeman Wilson of the Chicago Urban League. Um, we real Chicago. Thank you guys for tuning in. And I want to get into the numbers a bit. Um, on the Chicago U Urban League website, I believe you were quoted saying, we know that black owned businesses have less access to capital and other resources needed to be uh, successful. Karen, there seems to be a, a wealth gap when it comes to black businesses in Chicago compared to other businesses. What can explain that gap and what are the effects of it? Well, you know, you quoted uh, or read the quote that talked about less access to capital. That's a big explanation. The um, Because if you don't have the access to capital, you can't market to build your customer base as much as other businesses. You can't um, equip yourselves with technology as much as other businesses so that during a time when you were forced to shut down, you could have pivoted uh, using technology to a, a curbside service or to do a delivery service. And so that's what the Urban League does on a daily basis. We help black businesses think about how do you pivot? How do you market? How do you uh, provide the same customer service, but on a limited basis? But if you look at programs such as the PPP program, we know that during the first round of PPP, black businesses had very little access to those loans because they were able, because PPP was provided through banks, through local banks. And if you didn't have a relationship, an existing relationship, it was very hard for you to gain access to that capital. And so we're suggesting that one of the ways that we compensate for that lack of access is to do promotions like this, to provide enhancements through the services that we provide at the Urban League so that we can, in a sense, level the playing field. I was just going to say, it sounds like an equal playing field to me. Uh, we love to see it over here at the tribe. So what types of businesses are featured or are going to be featured on the site? And uh, what can folks expect to see? And when does the website launch? Actually, Well, the website launches on November 24th you will see over 500 businesses representing all sectors. You will see food serving businesses, coffee shops, caterers, uh, restaurants. You will see uh, personal service businesses like beauty and barber shops, uh, legal uh, offices, law offices, and uh, architectures. You will see uh, invitation businesses. This morning, I was on a program with someone who designs wedding and other types of invitations. You'll see clothing shops and art galleries, bookstores. There are a variety of Black businesses that people often don't know about, but we're hoping after Tuesday, they won't have a hard time finding them because they'll just be able to go to blackshopfriday.com. That's awesome. And while we're on the uh, topic, you named plenty of businesses, but any businesses specifically you like to maybe give a special shout out to? Well, you know, I certainly want to give a shout out to uh, Nicole and the Invitation Architect. I want to give a shout out to uh, Out of the Box Caterers and uh, Nicole Jordan Catering, uh, Exquisite Catering, uh, Fuse Catering, and that's because they just uh, serviced our organization through our Golden Fellowship Dinner, and they all did a, a superb job. 
Wonderful, just wonderful. So, uh, and we'll get ready to wrap it up here. Karen, where can people uh, keep up with you and the Chicago Urban League? Please, the floor is yours once again. Well, we certainly want people to look at us or to check us out at chiul.org. We're, of course, on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. And, um, you know, we just want to continue to serve the Black community. And one of the ways that we can all serve the Black community is to put the Black in Black Friday. Most definitely. Chicago Urban League President and CEO, Karen Freeman Wilson. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rome J. No problem. All right, family. And hey, let's make sure we support Black businesses on Black Friday. The site blackshopfriday.com goes live on Tuesday, November 24th. Thank you, uh, Madam President, once again for joining us. Awesome. So it's time to get into some new music and news. We like to call this segment The Forecast. Let's get into it. So... Meg Thee Stallion has shared the track list for her debut album, Good News. Everybody knows Meg is coming off a big year, right? Well, she was just named as GQ's Rapper of the Year, and this album is star-studded, featuring the likes of Beyonce, Young Thug, SZA, City Girls, Big Sean, 2 Chains, and that's not even the entire list. Track six is entitled Movie and features Chicago's very own Lil Durk, and Durk's been busy this year. Uh, most recently announcing that he's going to be releasing a new album soon called The Voice, named after the single he released early September. Still rolling from the momentum uh, featuring in Drake's uh, Laugh Now, Cry Later. Dirk is definitely in position to have an explosive 2021. Now, The Voice was set to drop in October, according to Lil Dirk's Instagram page. But following the death of King Von, Dirk has deactivated his Instagram, leaving fans wondering when will we hear from Lil Dirk again? Season one of Hashtag Forum Fridays concluded with a cypher featuring Chance the Rapper, Vic Mensa, and last week's guest, Bella Boz. Snaps for Bella. All right. Filmed exclusively for the Fund the Forum fundraiser, the cypher was to help raise funds to bring back Brownsville's notorious theater, The Forum. The Forum, located in Chicago's historic Brownsville community, was built in 1897. The structure contains one of the most important performance halls in the city, and possibly the oldest hardwood ballroom dance floor in Chicago. Now we're going to go ahead and wrap up the forecast with some new music, of course. Um, first, starting out with, let's start out with Sprato. Follow my lead, the Belizean rock star. Uh, wraps up a strong year as we head into the cold winter months. Sprato heats things up in this wet and wild video. Sprato's had some success this year, teaming up with NLE Choppa for the Magic Remix. Now at a half a million views on YouTube and the views for Follow My Lead have been growing now around 30,000 after only a week. Sprato is looking strong right now. Make sure you guys check out all his music and he's pretty much on all streaming platforms across the board. Shout out the young boy Sprato. Uh, next up, Cassius Tay, Fears May Come. So Cassius Tay, just video for Fears May Come. Uh, the marketing that went into this debut was done really well. Uh, with the full campaign on social up until the video aired last night at 6.15. So much so that it just, it really caught my attention as I was surfing online and I decided to listen and I'm really glad I did. As usual, Tay gives us a real, he gives us real rap raw uh, and speaks on his biggest fears uh, with the first line being, my biggest fear is dying alone. We featured Tay here at the tribe before and it's good to see him still at it and improving. Make sure you guys check that out. Next, last but not least, of course, OG Steve-O uh, continues to fill up the bag with goodies. It seems like everything he puts out is a banger and he's super versatile, putting out songs this year like Nipsey, which is like a hood ballad. Uh, three months ago, uh, him and one of my favorites, Lil Blessing, collabed for the Hurt People track, which is just, uh, you know, just jiggy. You know, it's a feel good vibe. Don't scuff him in September, which sounds more like drill. And now we get stuck, which sounds like the original dance party OG Steve-O style that we all fell in love with in years past. Uh, Steve-O Reloaded is his most recent project, so make sure you guys go check that out on whatever streaming site you prefer. All right. Now, we're lucky to live in a city like Chicago, though our current state has limited our ability to socialize 
Promoters and others in the city's entertainment scene in Chicago have found a way to adapt. Kudos to them. My next guest is no stranger to throwing a good party or curating a good vibe. Chicago native Teddy Gilmore is a bar and club owner with more than 30 years of experience. He's the director of operations at Nipsey's Restaurant on the city's southeast side. Welcome to Re Real Chicago, Teddy. What's going on, brother? What's up, man? How you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure, an honor to have you on. Uh, and congratulations on the grand opening of Nipsey's. Man, thank you, man. I appreciate that. It's an honor yep. to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So before we learn more about Nipsey's and the grand opening, I'd like to pause for a sec and just run through the Rome J report with you, Teddy, which is our take on current arts and entertainment news, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's do it. So, I, and I don't know about you, Teddy, but it seems like the virus is just getting closer and closer and closer to home. Um, family. Very much so. Yes, sir. And look, hey guys, please keep Chicago singer Jeremiah in your thoughts this week. Last weekend, word spread online that uh, he was being hospitalized for COVID-19. Now the singer is still in the ICU in critical condition. Um, said his agent in a statement to Variety. On Wednesday, a representative for the singer's family gave an update on his condition to CNN. Let's read that real quick. A great team of doctors and nurses is helping him pull through. He's not out of the woods yet, but progress is being made. The family and friends are praying that he starts breathing on his own soon and makes a full recovery. Yes, sir. Yeah, he went to Morgan Park with my wife, actually. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, good guy, good guy. Yeah, prayers out to Jeremiah. We're hoping he makes a speedy recovery. I just got an update that said he's in critical condition. So prayers out to Jeremiah for sure. Definitely. President Obama dropped the first volume presidential memoirs this week. A Promised Land was released on Tuesday. You can find it wherever books are sold. Are you interested in reading what Obama has to say, Teddy? I'm definitely. I mean, just watching the interviews, he was, he was kind of coming at a dude's head in the White House right now. I can oh, appreciate yeah. that. No doubt. And I mean, I think we all had in the back of our head that Obama was going to uh, join Biden's cabinet. Apparently, uh, the first lady, the former first lady shot that down. She's ready for, for that stuff <laughs> to be over. So, you know, it's, right. good, it's good to hear from uh, from President Brock, though, whenever we can. Yeah, hear it's him. good to hear someone form sentences, you know, and speak like they have a little bit of sense. So I'm it's glad always, he's back in the scene. Yeah. When we can get an adult in the room as a country, exactly. that's always a good thing. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. All right. Now, you know the Saints say every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Uh, the Chicago Bulls just announced grant recipients for its community assist fund. Each year, the Chicago Bulls charities awards financial grants to nonprofit organizations that support underserved Chicagoans. 27, 27 excuse me, organizations were named recipients this year. Got to love our Bulls. Love the Bulls, huh? Hey, so, Teddy, how about those bears, man? <laughs> You know, lifelong Bears fan, and um, I, you know, it's, I always think they do the wrong thing. I <laughs> honestly wish they would just sell the team. I think oh, that yeah. uh, owners depend upon the revenue from the Bears to live, and it doesn't work out. I mean, it's a different type of industry these days. They need to spend some money and go get some real players. Like, there's, there's no reason. I mean, it's just, it's, it's always disappointing. You know, there's no way we know there's no way we keep Khalil Mack. He's gonna leave. Oh man. Well, on that note, rapper G Herbo <laughs> teased the new single run fashion line collab with Lyrical Lemonade and the Chicago Bears this week. Let's go ahead and roll that clip. Hey, yo, move, move out the way, man. You don't see me in the middle of something? 
So that's dope. That's actually my first time seeing that. Boy, they're Not getting too. creative with the bag. It's always interesting for me to see how these artists are have to, pretty much have to pivot to make money during the age of COVID. Teddy, what do you think about this, man? Do you like any of these looks? What do you think? Well, I thought it was cool. I, I wish he would have uh, probably picked up that little lemon, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But other than that, I would like to see a bear tackle the lemon or something. But other than that, I see where he's going with it, so I can appreciate it. Okay, on Monday, November 22nd, y'all will be able to cop pieces from the collection on the Bears Pro Shop and Lyrical Lemonade websites. I'm going to have to check that out, man. You know I'm a fan. Um, mm -hmm. In other Chicago sports news, Theo Epstein, Chicago Cubs president, is stepping down after nine years with the clubhouse, Cubs general manager Jed Hoyer will take on the reins. Theo took the Cubs to the next level. It was under Epstein's leadership that the team became a playoff contender and won a World Series title in 2016. I tell you, I remember exactly where I was the moment that happened. Teddy, are you a Sox or Cubs fan? North White Sider? Sox. White Sox, South Sider. What, oh, what, I mean, so does this news affect you? What do you think about this news? Doesn't really affect me, except I'm good friends with the VP over there, Julian Green. So, you know, I, I support him, but I'm a South Side. I like the White Sox whole life. One for one. It's good to see both teams, I mean, back relevant. So, true. Yeah. True. All right. Well, thanks, Teddy, for answering those. Now, let's talk about you, the man himself, okay. Teddy Gilmore. Uh, if you guys are just now joining me, I got Teddy Gilmore with me, a uh, former owner, I believe, of Drink House, right, Teddy? And um, yep. uh, overall entrepreneur, businessman, um, new owner of the director of operations down there at Nipsey's, the new spot over on the southeast side. Uh, we got him with me right now. We Real Chicago. It's your boy, Roe and Jay. So once again, congrats uh, on the new restaurant, Nipsey's. Thank you. And you know, Thank I mean, when we think, when we hear Nipsey's, we all think about Martin, you know what I'm saying? My man Nipsey, he had on the outfit and the white shirt, mm -hmm. the vest. Definitely. And, you know, uh, so it, it, did that solely inspire the name and how did you how did you land on Nipsey's? Um, you know what? I was thinking about neighborhood. I wanted it to be maybe like the Black Cheers and just, you know, I'm a big fan of Martin. So it was more of a homage for a place where people can come, you know, on the South Side. And when I decided to make this journey south it was like okay let's come up with something that's so unique and people can just have a good place where you can still have a downtown feel uh we built this place to be to stand up to a downtown lounge or restaurant so but it's on the south side so we want it to be a place where people could just kind of you know have a good time and say hey this is where we hung out at you know and that seemed like where martin would just go to hang out at so wanted to make sure that we did the same thing with this particular uh restaurant and and when you when you mentioned coming over to the south side, Teddy, you you've uh, you've operated on the north side for the most part with with Nuvo and uh, with Drink House, as I mentioned before. What made you decide to bring Nipsey's back home to the neighborhood where you once grew up in? Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, well, for myself, it was kind of a lot of things, you know. And and we opened Nuvo in 2013, and at that point, people were. You know, it was surprising. We were telling people all the systemic racism that was going on down there. And, you know, people just didn't want us. And we were, you know, we were doing a lot of different things. At that time, it wasn't as prevalent. You know, I had people saying, oh, you're just making that up. You're trying to play the black card. I'm like, I'm telling you what's going on here. You know, and it was, uh, it was to the point where everyone seemed comfortable going downtown. And so for me, I always wanted to come back. So even when I had Drink House, this spot was actually being formed and it was always my goal to um come back home and it just gave the right opportunity the, uh you know it felt good it felt uh positive to be wanted on the south side uh the alderman was very welcoming um and it's something to be said about when you walk down the street you don't have to worry about people um you know characterizing you or just a stereotype that you're at home 
So, you know, we have all different type of people walking in front of Nipsey's. And so no one's calling the police just because they look a certain way. And that was something that was needed. And I felt uh, energy of coming back to where I grew up at and to help build that community back up as well and make it a destination spot. Because many moons ago, uh, you know, they have places like Sweet Georgia Browns out there. And I mean, the Bulls, you had Pippen, Jordan, Horace Grant, they all hung out on the South Side. Uh, you know, it wasn't these spots they were going to and that were downtown. And so to have that and be a part of that type of history, it was important to me. Right. And I did want to talk to you. Can you can you just speak towards how that area, I mean, that stretch on Stony has a number of bars, but how has that area changed since you were coming up? Um, well, when I was coming up, it was, you know, you had those bars and now not so many bars over there today. You have uh Darren's that's over there, uh S2 Grill is coming, you have the licking coming over there, you have a lot of different places that are coming up that are going to make an appearance on Stony Island. And, you know, I've been telling people this is going to be the new Black Wall Street because it's all black owned businesses or right off the expressway. You can get there. You know, it's a, a up and coming, you know, and I grew up in Peel Hill and it's always been a very progressive neighborhood. So for me, I think it's an opportunity for us to expand. And I, I kind of want, you know, I, I think I was telling your producer, I always encourage a lot of the promoters to not necessarily, you know, you got to start having equity in these places. I spent a long time making a lot of owners money. And at the end of the day, you have to put yourself in a position where you can have your own spot because you'll grow up and think that this particular place uh, is that it's so hard to own. And it's not, you know, they're not smarter than us. They just had an opportunity to own a bar. And that's kind of what sparked me. I was at a, a club back in the day. It was called Stone Lotus. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's on uh, Orlane Street. And I just looked at the owner. The owner was in behind the bar just drinking and pouring drinks in people's mouths. I looked and I said, that's it for me. I'm like, I, you know, one, not only did I graduate from Florida and m University, I'm just smarter than this guy. And I'm like, I'm making him all the money and he's sitting back there acting like a buffoon. So for me, I always encourage people to make that type of move. And I think more people are going to start doing this. Wonderful, wonderful. We got Teddy Gilmore with us today, guys. Okay, so Teddy, I wanted to try something, maybe a little, let's try a, a rapid fire kind of segment. Just real quick answers. I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, quick questions. I want quick answers. All right, if you can. Sure. All right, so. So your favorite place like, and we'll go uh, the first black owned spot that comes to mind, if you can. So your favorite black owned spot to catch a game, maybe on Sunday or whatever. Um, I would say Persona. Okay. Uh, and let's go your favorite place, your favorite Southern fried chicken spot. Harold's Chicken. Which location? I like the one on 22nd in Michigan. Nice, nice. Uh, let's say you want to have a night out on a town and you want to go dancing. I'm going to go dancing. Little known fact, most, there's no black owned nightclub in the city of Chicago. Whoa. People don't realize that, but that's a fact. Yeah, you know, there's no black owned, but I would say, um, you would, if I had a choice, I would probably go to a uh, bureau bar. I like bureau bar downtown as well. The new South loop location. And Let's go listen to live music. You know, that's going to be a tough one. I would say because they don't, there's not a lot of live music. So my wife likes a lot. I would say maybe the wild hair, but it's not black owned. So, right, right. Okay. And so. let's say, and you just mentioned that you're married, but let's go into a different universe. You're on a first mm -hmm. date. Where would you go on an imaginary first date? in the city black owned? Um, I think to the DuSable Museum and then dinner, probably Virtue in Hyde Park. Nice, nice. There we go. A little bit of winery and dinery. Yep. Here with my man, Mr. Gilmore. Okay, so of course, uh, we're still in the midst of COVID-19, Teddy restrictions. Uh, and y'all, so maybe when y'all side opens, uh, maybe you guys can go visit some of these places that Teddy has mentioned. Uh, so be on the lookout for that, guys. We know a lot of businesses struggling, so we just want to 
kind of look out and support black businesses when we can, if we can, whenever we can. So in June, Teddy, you organized a march with other black club owners and promoters calling uh, for the end of nightlife racism. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it a couple of minutes ago, kind of, um, when you just mentioned going out and being comfortable um, and not worrying about maybe what kind of shoes you have on or what kind of outfit. It, can you just walk us through why you organized this march? Well, for a long time, uh, most people really don't, if, unless you've actually tried to promote events downtown, it's very segregated. Um, you know, most of these places that do allow black promoters to come in, they're, on, they're about to go out of business and black promoters usually come along and save them. Um, you know, for me, having experienced it over 20 years, I've seen what this particular police department, which is the 18th district in the downtown area, they kind of target African-Americans. And they literally, you know, I was at Nouveau Tavern one time and another club owner actually called me and said, hey, did you get a call from the police commander? And I'm like, no. And she, they were like, they don't want us to do any more urban events. And I literally laughed. I was like, really? Well, you can't tell me that, you know, I'm, doing, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm black, so I'm gonna continue to do black events. And it was interesting because, you know, this is what's been going on for a long time. And, you know, I often tell my wife, had I decided to, I'll, you know, when I left college, everybody was going to Atlanta because of the Olympics. You know, had I gone to Atlanta to do what I do now, you know, I'd be 20, 30, $40 million richer because it's just wide open. And so for us to have these struggles and be targeted and just constant issues and have to worry about what's going to happen when you make a move or you do something, you know, that one, that's a lot of stress on people, you know, and then to be able to constantly have to come back and you're worried about absolutely nothing. Like you have, you know, I was at Nouveau Tavern and, um, you know, I had some celebrity basketball players come and people were literally throwing eggs from their apartment building onto these uh, Rolls Royces. And these are the type of things that, you know, people didn't see. I had my ballet got pulled from me and the ballet guy who was a, a Latin guy, he said, I can't do it because my boss is telling me that the guy owns this Hilton. He, you know, a lot of these guys have these huge houses out in the suburbs and they live in River North on, you know, the weekends and things of that nature. He's like, you know, they're telling me not to work with you. And so it was interesting. And up until a certain point, our landlord was really for us. And then they came after him and they started giving him violations. And he said he couldn't, he couldn't stay with us anymore. You know, he couldn't back us up anymore. And it's just, you know, it's unfortunate, but this is the city we live in. And, you know, you've seen this come out now big time over the past two years. And it's something that I've experienced for a long time. And just to see it, you know, that particular alderman down there in the 42nd Ward, he's, you know, he, he's straight up with it. He doesn't have to worry about the African-American vote. And he said this much. He's like, you know, I don't have to, um, you know, I'm not, not worried, I'm not worried about the African-American vote in my ward. So it wasn't a big thing. And like I told him, he'll be an alderman for the rest of his life. And upon the day, upon him trying to run for a citywide or a statewide office, you'll see me boot up. We'll, I'll meet him across the bridge, wherever he decides that he's going to run. It won't be one place. He'll have to campaign in the 42nd Ward because I will definitely make sure people remember how he treated us down there. So that being said, I mean, take, for example, Wrigleyville, for example, on any mm -hmm. given day, wh whether it's a Cubs win or just a holiday or any weekend with nice weather, Wrigleyville can be just straight up off the chain. I mean, do you feel that? Exactly. The city well, uh, let's take let's take your picture, for example. You see all those police officers out there? They're out there for a reason. They're out there to protect. Now, they're out there also because they know the majority of those people are going to be drunk. And so they're out there to protect. When we organized that march, one of the things is saying, how come you can't give us the same protection when we have mm -hmm. events downtown? And no one can answer that question. That's usually what most people are looking for. Um, it, they have this thing uh, called Clear Path, which is a Chicago police department, shows you where all the violence is. Wrigleyville is the most violent area for taverns in the city of Chicago, hands wow. down, not even compared. But, you know, there's a reason behind that. And so they get extra money because clearly the clubs kick in extra money. But it's a very 
violent area. It's fights, it's drugs, it's rapes, it's stabbing and all different types of things. They would have you believe otherwise, you know, about African-American events that occur in different places. And it's just not true. Like, it's, it's just facts. The numbers are not going to lie to you, you know. And if they're, they're, if you look at it and it literally, you can go back, I believe you can go back six months. You can compare. You can compare them and see. It's just violent. And when wow. you think about it, based upon the number of people that live in the city, I mean, it was, we're not, we're not. It's not going to be, it's not enough African-American promoters. It's not enough African-American bars for us to even have those type of numbers where they say it's so violent. But now you let one incident, like, let's say someone gets shot at a part. Oh, my goodness. It's just everything. And, you know, I was telling you about an incident when they said stop doing African-American events. Someone had gotten shot at an African-American uh, party and they decided they should just shut down everything. And the problem that I have with that is, we do this whole big, we're going to just stop things. Now, if someone got shot at McDonald's, they're not shutting down all the McDonald's. Somebody gets shot at Starbucks, they're not going to shut down all the Starbucks. And so these businesses are legitimate businesses. And I remember telling people, I was, I was really concerned about my staff at Drink House. And somebody's like, well, why would you be concerned about your staff? You should be worried about the neighbors. And I'm like, these people are depending on these jobs. And you just basically came from behind and just, you know, took their jobs away. And that's something, you know, to be said on how people look at different, you know, how, it, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar, not in my backyard. That's kind of how people look at it. Like, well, not in my backyard, go somewhere else. And so many times people say, oh, you should just go to the South side, go to the South side. And I was reluctant to go to the South side because I felt I had a right to be downtown. It's like, I wanted to be downtown because I have a right to be downtown. Right. And so, I'm going to go to the South side on my own terms, not because you told me to go. And so this particular situation gives us an opportunity to be on the South side and create a whole new landscape that can be built upon, you know, to me, kind of going back to where we all came from, because I came when I came up, I came up looking at places like the Raven and, you know, the Copper Box and Sweet Georgia Browns. Those were important places as we grew up and it's really if you build it people will come i was talking to your producer and she was like you know all my favorite places are shut down so now i've had opportunity to go to local spots and people say local dives and there are a lot of places like that that you wouldn't know about because we're, we're so focused on being downtown and you know to me the media has done a hell of a job on just pounding the south side of chicago and it's not like that you know we don't have that level of violence when it comes down to it. Now, I, I I live in Bronzeville and I've lived in South Loop and I'll be the first one to tell you South Loop is way more violent than Bronzeville. And, yeah. you know, and I'll put that up against anybody that wants to argue about it because I've lived in both of them. And one is way worse than the other. And it's just, you know, you see it. I mean, it's all over the news. And, you know, I'm sure soon enough, they're going to start saying, well, South Loop is on the South side because that's what they did, you know? And you have to kind of start looking at all these things. And, you know, my wife's in real estate and there was a reason why they were beating um, Inglewood up like that and saying Inglewood was bad. You know, you look at the property, you can't even buy property now over in Inglewood. It's a, I'm talking about the bids are so high and they don't look like me and you, the people that's buying them, believe it or not, they do not look like me and you anymore. Right. And you have to look at, you know, when you start putting $75 million schools in places, what's about to happen? And so these are the things that we're dealing with. I'm hoping that, you know, we get more people on board. I, would, I challenge all my young uh, African-American promoters, this is, you know, stop promoting at these places. Get your own place. Get your own place. It's not that hard. I'm, I'm a, me, I'm forever student. I love working with young people. I love helping people. Because I'm never one that feels like I got to have everything. I feel like the more people that own their own spots, the better this industry will be. The more African-American restaurants that we have, more African-American bars. And most people don't realize it. there's not one nightclub, not one African-American nightclub in the city of Chicago. And when you think about that, every alderman and mayor should be, you know, ashamed of that. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're forced to go to, you know, if you, let's just say, you know, get this big uh, Gucci Mane and um, Jeezy battle going on. Let's say we brought them here. They, there's no place for them to go in the city of Chicago. You gotta go to House of Blues. 
prison, maybe towel, sound bar, but you can't go. You can't say, hey, what if they just said, you know what? I just want to perform at an African-American spot. You can't do it. Like the closest, you, the closest thing they had to it was Adriana's and they had to go way out. And exactly. That exactly. And so now that's not even there, but I'm saying that's a problem in a city our size. And someone has to stand up and say, hey, that's something that needs to be addressed as well, that we need funding. And I was listening to um, the young lady you had on before me. That's something that we need access to, because if we get into a position where we can have we need a we this, a, this one, this third largest city in the country, how we don't have a spot. So if, if Jay, what happens when Jay-Z or Beyonce say, hey, I do want to come to Chicago and do something. We got to go to prison. We got to go to Cal. You know what I'm saying? We got to go to Soundbar. It's time for us to have our own spot. And I feel like the aldermen and people like that, it, the one thing, and you know, my best friend always say, the one thing they can't ever get away with anymore is saying, we don't have the resources to do it. When they needed resources, they found a way to get it. You know, they found a way and, you know, it was no argument. But you spent a billion dollars on a Lincoln Yard project. I'm not sure, are you familiar with that? It's a project on the north side, and they spent a billion dollars. That's what a B to wow. build that, and that came from you know. And when you look at it, it's in the middle of um. I used to do events at Green Dolphin. It's not too far from Green Dolphin, and it's um, you know, we don't have something like that coming on the south side. But you know, the thing that are you familiar with um? There's a group that owns a lot of real estate. They actually just sold their uh building in um. They own the McDonald's building. I can't think of their names right now, but um, they started off being nightclub owners and they moved into the real estate game. And so they've done all these different nightclubs from Tao, you know, they own all this real estate and Fulton Market and pretty much they can do whatever they want to do. And the problem that I have with them is they never invite an African-American in to say, hey, let's partner with them. And that particular alderman in that area could say, hey, why aren't you partnering with African-Americans, not just to build, but to install businesses? And the one thing I will say this while while we're talking, I encourage all my African-American promoters, if you can't buy a spot, great. But when you go to these places, demand that the bar staff is 50 percent black, demand that security is 50 percent black. You can do a lot of things to ensure them to start moving in the right direction while while you're there. Because, you know, just to come in and take our money is not, you know, that's not good enough. And, you know, coming up in this particular industry, you always have people say, oh, well, African Americans don't spend money. I've never been to an African American party where I could walk straight to the bar. (laughs) I've never seen it. So it's just, you know, when you think about it, you know, I can go in a lot of white events and walk straight to the bar, I've never seen that. So this is something that's been used and, you know, we're seeing this play out in real, time now as far as uh how this particular president is working they just they'll lie and say something and you know the one thing that you know that really irks me whenever and it, they, i've heard this so many times they say well oh man you know after the party i see black people just urinating on the street and i'm like that's a lie i'm like people ain't just doing that they just not doing that just for the heck of it you know that's not happening and when they start saying, oh, girl, I've never seen, you know, I don't see black girls doing stuff like that. And for me, it's something that's stereotypical that you just make up. Now, with the introduction of cameras and things, you're starting to see how these particular Karens operate. You know, and then mind you, I've been dealing with this for 20 plus years where it wasn't that available. But now you're starting to see, yeah, they do lie. They will call the police like they did on the brother in Central Park. They lie. And so... Now it's playing out on camera where you're like, oh, we didn't know that. And I'm like, you know, well, it sounds good. I've lost millions of dollars dealing with this situation. And so at some point, you know, I'm, you know, I'm always hopeful that somebody's going to file this giant class action lawsuit and they're going to come make, you know, amends for this because things happen. So, and, and Teddy, I want to back it up. First of all, thank you for that answer, by the way. And I just want to back it up uh, just a second. Uh, going back to Nipsey's, uh, a lot of people on our side are excited to see what the menu would look like. Can you explain to us what we can expect to see on Nipsey's menu, whether it's something new, yes. something we've seen from you before? The floor is yours. Well, um, yes. You know, we have uh, fried chicken right there. 
We have, um, that's our sliders that we have. It's basically a Southern, we have a Southern, American Southern menu that features uh, wraps, that features our chicken dinners. Our number one seller right now is the catfish dinner. Um, everyone likes it. We've also added uh, to it fried uh, fr fried cauliflower. And the cauliflower is really flying off. Um, tomorrow, we actually launch our seared blackened salmon, which is amazing. You know, and I'm kind of iffy on the salmon. This salmon was great. And so I was like, wow, so we're going to be pushed. We're going to push that on out. Uh, we have a pizza called the Stony Island pizza and it has caramelized onions on it, sausage, pepperonis. And it's really, it's a good top seller for us as well. Um, our first menu wasn't really designed as a delivery menu. We opened probably two days after the uh, governor and the mayor shut indoor dining down. So we had kind of had to adjust a little bit. And that's what we've been doing over the past couple of weeks, just kind of adjusting to how we want to get stuff out. And, you know, for most restaurants where everybody's just hanging on until we can get this uh, vaccine and get the vaccine ready to roll. You know, I for one will be, you know, I'm going to take the vaccine. You know, you got a lot of people out here saying, oh, don't do it. And the Tuskegee experiment. While well, I hear that, Tuskegee experiment was a different time where they could hide stuff. It's pretty hard to hide stuff these days. And they're going to try. It's kind of like saying this guy's trying to steal this election. You know, he probably could have got away with it in 1950. Can't get away with it today. Yeah, I think um, I think like you said, now we have a now we have an adult in the room, and I think uh, President elect Biden kind of has a point to prove. Um, yes. So you know, if there's a vaccine, I agree with you. I'm going to take it. Uh, I've caught backlash for saying that, but I'll say it publicly. Mm -hmm. I am taking a vaccine I'm when it's available. Uh, I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it on Instagram too. I'm I'm going to take it. Let me tell you why they're going to how they're going to get most people to take it. Most people are going to be tired of staying at house. They're not going to let you fly without it. They're going to do things to make sure to ensure you get this. And people are saying, oh, I want to go to Miami. You're not going to be able to go to Miami, you know, unless you want to drive. If you want to drive 18 hours, but they're right. definitely not going to let you get on those planes and things of that nature. And Pfizer, you know, most people have something from Pfizer in their cabinet or their med medicine cabinet. So, you know, these are not like some bootleg companies that are coming up with this. Um, and I'm in an industry that just, this is, you know, is it's the whole industry is hanging on with these vaccines. And so I'm going to definitely be in line to take it. Teddy, you talked about having pretty much that fundamental right to be able to be represented downtown. And that's why you chose to go there and stay there as long as you did. Uh, now that you're back on the South side, um, can you ever, can, can you picture yourself venturing out up North again or having an establishment downtown again? This is probably going to sound, um, arrogant, I think the mayor would have to ask me to come south or someone would have to, they would have to have, you know, it have to be in a position where they say, hey, we want you to come south and come down here and do it. Because other than that, it's like, I'm going to build my community that looks like me. You know, my stress level is down. I don't have to worry about, you mm. know, the police rolling up, coming, you know, when the police roll up to Nipsey's now, they're like, man, we love this spot, man. We can't wait for you to open back up. It's not looking at me like I'm crazy, telling me go get my license off the wall, you know, and let me see your driver's license. These are the type of things that we had to deal with there. We were harassed at a higher level. And again, this is 20 plus years I've had to deal with this. You're just starting to feel, and now, like if I told you that, you believe it. Eight years ago, people were like, no, nah, this is not like that. You got to be doing something. I'm like, I'm telling you, it's not like that. This wow. is what's going on in Chicago. So, you know, I could see myself going back downtown. I would avoid the particular aldermen. And, you know, I was telling the producer, you know, I know the alderman and where Drink House was. And he, he's not a bad person, but he was straight up. He said, listen, I'm not, I can't. My constituents, you know, they, they're going crazy. And he told me, he said, they probably are racist. And so that's just what happened. And, you know, he, he did it. You didn't see me come out a lot about it because at the end of the day, I'm, this is a, they say politics. I call it politics and people are going to do what they need to do. But at the same time, I knew I was going somewhere else. You know, a lot of people don't realize that Nipsey was funded by the city of Chicago. You know, Neighborhood Opportunity Fund helped pay for some of the build out and everything for Nipsey's, which was important because they they have. And I'm not sure. And I'll explain neighborhood, the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, any building over 
three stories high that's being built downtown, they have to pay like a million dollars. I'm not sure how much into a fund. And that mm. fund is to fund uh, projects on the south and west side of Chicago. And so as they keep building downtown, I'm like, we can build our own place and we can have our own Mecca and our own place where we're comfortable at going. And we can make it so it's nice. I've had clubs downtown, so we know how to operate them. We know how to operate restaurants in the downtown area. So now we're going to operate at the same standard on the south side of Chicago. And it's been welcoming. And again, you know, that stress is something for most African-American men that people don't realize to have to worry. And, you know, it's the same stress of when the cop pulls behind you and you got to pull over. Imagine that in your own building and you're worried every day when they're going to pull up and what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, you showed the picture of the police officers being in front of Wrigley and they're out there because people have been drinking all day and they would never, we've never had that type of protection. And one of the things that happened is the protection, they have this, it's called a moonlighting law. And that's so police officers can't work where liquor is actually served at. That particular law has been on the books since Al Capone. It needs to be removed. Every other major city, you have police officers help protect the space. That's kind of what you need in order in the city of Chicago. And for anyone to say, you know, listen, the city of Chicago is a violent city. Different things happen. But you're not going to put all that weight just on us or on African American. It has a lot to do with the disparity in jobs, the disparity in having finances and businesses. It's a lot. And so before we start talking about how violent Chicago is, we also have to talk about how they have not given us the same opportunities as the other side of the city. So back it up, Teddy. Are you saying that officers aren't allowed inside establishments where liquor is being served? They no, they're not. Chicago police officers cannot work inside of establishments in the city of Chicago. That's the law. It's called the moonlighting law. You can work in a restaurant, like a restaurant without liquor. But if you have liquor in there, you can't work there. Wow. It's against their rules. And so, you know, you, when you go to these other cities like Miami or, or Atlanta, they actually have police officers that work these particular events. That one little change in the law would eliminate a lot of issues for the city. And I think it's something that, you know, should be brought up. It's something that I think we will, I will bring up, but this whole COVID thing makes it so, and we'll, we'll get to that point. But, you know, people understand, you know, we want the same things as everybody else has, meaning nobody wants to have fights and different things at their establishment, but you also have thousands and, I mean, thousands of nightclub bars for white people, handful for black people. So everybody's forced to go to the same place. And a lot of times what it ends up doing is pitting people against each other. And that's, that's a big problem that we have in the city. And it doesn't need to be like that because it's only 10, it's only a handful of places. Like, you know, we can't go down a list of places that actually function in the city. And so we got to get out of, once we got to get out of that, but we also have to be in a position where one, we can help one another, which is one of the things that I'm doing on the South side that, you know, I've met with most of the bar owners. I'm trying to be with everybody that's on the South side so we can have our own coalition. And I learned that from being downtown, believe it or not. And like I said, I'm going to take everything I learned from downtown and bring it to the South side. And we're going to have the South side flourish just like downtown because once upon a time, Rush Street was nothing but hookers, and prostitutes and drug dealers. Mm. Believe that, that's a fact. When I was coming up, it was a it was a terrible place to be. Mm. And so, you know, you look at South Loop, you could not walk through South Loop. South Loop was a horrible area with warehouses. And so a lot of people don't realize that in like West Town, places like that, it was bad, man. And, and so these places changed over the past 20 years. So you can change the whole areas if you have that vision. And I feel like, that's the one thing that we'll do. We used to meet once a week or once a month with all the different um, entertainment venues in the downtown area. So that's what we're going to bring to the South Side, too. I've already started to meet with people and we're going to build our own coalition so we can bring different ideas and we can say, hey, this is what's going on and we need to be aware of certain things. And that's what they would do. And they would meet with the police officers. But they met with the police officers on their terms, not the police officers setting up the meeting. They held the meeting and invited the police officers and the aldermen to come to them. And that's how we have to be. We have to be able to sit down and get together. You know, I just talked to the owners over at Darren's, which is on 87th Street. We had a great meeting. And that's the type of relationship that I plan on bringing to the South Side because I feel like 
the more we can get together on the same page, we can build the same infrastructure as they have downtown. I agree with you wholeheartedly. There's no reason why Chicago can't be a hub of black entertainment and black yeah. culture, just like uh, in the sense of in Atlanta or, or something like that. Um, Teddy Gilmore, every, everybody. Uh, Teddy, what's next for you? Uh, tell the people how they can keep up with you and Nipsey's. Please, the floor is yours. Um, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Everything is Teddy Gilmore or at Teddy Gilmore. Um, you know, next for me is to continue building. I'm going to me and my wife, we plan on doing a breakfast restaurant soon. Um, something that's, you know, kind of close to my heart. I'm a big breakfast eater. Um, as well as being able to expand just out of Chicago too and do some things in some different areas. Um, the mayor of Atlanta, we went to school together, Keisha Lance Bottom, and, uh, you know, constantly trying to get down to Atlanta and make sure I make the right moves with her and just building, you know, we're trying to build and continue to grow. That's my next move is growing. I guess my, if you might, my immediate, immediate next move would be my breakfast restaurant that I'm building. Nice, nice. And hey, if Nipsey's ever needs a host, uh, you know, a, 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 a special <laughs> guy do whatever, I'm always here for you, my brother. Uh, Teddy, director of operations, Nipsey's entrepreneur, uh, all around guy that you guys need to know. Teddy, it, it's an honor. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it, man. Definitely. We'll look forward to having you over there once outdoors open back up. Come over and host a couple of things for us. Yes, sir. We'll be in touch, Teddy. Thank you so much. All right, take care. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. Wow, that's our show. Great show. I had a great time. We want to thank our guest, uh, Teddy Gilmore, Director of Operations over at Nipsey's. Make sure you guys check that out over on the South Side. And Karen Freeman Wilson uh, from the Chicago Urban League. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Make sure to check out the scene to see what's popping this week in the city. If you have any questions about the show or want to reach out to us, Hit us up at connect at the tribe.com. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube page. You can find me, your boy, Rome J on Twitter at the Rome J underscore and on Instagram at Rome J underscore TV. I'm usually on Instagram a little bit more. So hit me up on there. If you're trying to get in touch with me, if all hearts are cleared, oh my gosh, we'll catch you guys next Thursday. I'm about to go catch this versus battle. Look, my heart is telling me uh, Gucci, but my mind is telling me Jeezy. I don't know what to go with. Who are you guys going for? Hit us up at connectatthetribe.com. Stay real, stay safe, Chicago. It's been real.